Hey guys, welcome back to the Timber Forge. So last video I made a throwable fireball using a system which turned rotation into motion, and today I'm going to fully explain every aspect about how exactly that system works. Although the system itself doesn't have too many commands, the execute store command and some of the vector system may be kind of confusing for some of you who aren't used to it. But before I go on, I just want to make sure to mention that Nope Names video on YouTube, link in the description, is where I first saw this system. However, the video is not really a full tutorial, so I just want to fully show and explain how it works and how you could actually implement it yourself. So let's get right into it. There's many ways to activate this system, such as the custom snowball from the throwable fireball video. You could get creative with it, but today I'm just going to go over the motion system itself. Now before I move on, I need to explain how the motion NBT tag works. The motion tag is just a 3D vector made of an X, Y, and Z axis magnitude. If you know how vectors work, just skip like 20 seconds. And if you don't, it's basically a set of three arrows, one for each dimension, that combine into a single arrow in a certain direction and of a certain strength. The ratio of x to y to z determines the direction that that vector points, and the overall sum of the vector's sizes determines the overall magnitude, which in this case is the speed of the projectile. So here's how the concept works, which I'll illustrate in my super advanced animation software. First, we summon the entity we're trying to launch. How about a pig? After we summon our projectile, we take its starting coordinates and store it into a scoreboard. For instance, let's say the pig is summoned at position 4, 5 on the 2D example plane. After we have that, we then teleport it a tiny bit in the direction we want the projectile to go. In game, we would use a basic vector coordinate teleport command while rotated as the player. For this example, I'll teleport it a larger amount than we would actually do. Let's say it moves to position 6, 6. Then we store the second coordinate. Now what we want is the vector that points in the direction that the object moved from the first to second position. In order to get that, we subtract the first coordinate set from the second coordinate set. As you'll see, what we're left with is the numbers that make up a vector pointing from the first to second point. Then we store this new value into the motion of the entity, and boom! The entity moves in the direction of the initial teleportation, but instead of constant choppy teleportation, we get smooth motion properly affected by gravity and the environment. If we need to change the overall strength, it's easy to just scale all of the values together and maintain its direction. The first thing you need to do is to summon your projectile that you'll be using motion for, and there's many ways to do this, so for the sake of example I'm just going to be running it from a function. So then I summon the projectile, in this case I'm doing TNT, and I'm summoning it in front of the player since I don't want it to be inside of the player's face. And then I have the tag, and this is the important part. You want to make sure that you have some sort of tag here that you could use to recognize all of the projectiles that you will use for your motion system. And then after this I just have Fuse 80 for the TNT, and that's only specific to TNT and like creepers, so it doesn't really matter. So if I just run this function, and it was throw, you'll notice it just summons this TNT. And then what we want to do after this is recognize any time a new projectile is summoned into the world, and then we want to apply that motion concept that I talked about earlier. Now that we summoned our projectile, I could create a new file which we'll use to create the motion system that I talked about earlier. So I'm going to go here and call it apply motion.mc function. And you could ignore all the other MC functions over here. The only ones you need right now are load, loop, however you summon your projectile, and then the apply motion function. And this is where we're going to create that function. But first of all, we need to make sure that we're running that function onto our projectile. So I'm going to do execute as all entities. And then remember earlier in the throw, we purposely added this tag so that we could identify the entity later on. So tag equals motion projectile. Then we want to go at that position. And then after this, this is where we want to set our proper rotation. So in my example, I want it to rotate as the nearest player. So I'm going to do rotated as nearest player. But if, for example, you want it to face something else, then instead of putting rotated, maybe use a facing part of the execute command. So rotated as the nearest player or whatever rotation you want. And then run function. And in my case, I called it apply motion, and my namespace is motion. So motion, apply motion. And now you'll see any time that we have a new projectile that we're trying to add motion to, it's going to set the rotation in the correct direction, and then it's going to run our function to actually apply the motion. And the issue here is that it will constantly run it until this entity is gone. So we want to make sure that it only runs once. And to do that, we're going to make sure it doesn't have a certain tag. And I'm going to call this motion added. And that means that it will not run if it gets the tag motion added. 
and then inside of apply motion we're going to add that tag tag at s add motion added that means the projectile will summon and then it will detect that it is new and doesn't have this tag yet it will run apply motion it will go to apply motion do the motion and then it will add this tag so in the future detections it will fail because it will have the tag called motion added so if i do a test here say motion so now you'll notice if i run the throw function inside of chat it'll say motion but then it only runs once because then it realizes that the motion has already been applied and there's no reason to run the command again. So if you remember, the first thing we have to do is write down the coordinates that the entity is summoned into. So in order to do that, we need scoreboards in the first place. So we're going to create six here. We're going to do X, Y, and Z for the first set and then X, Y, and Z for the second set. And you could name it whatever you want. So just do scoreboard, objectives, add and then whatever you want it to be named, just make sure to have the X, Y, or Z, and whether it's part of position one or two, and dummy to indicate that only commands will modify it. And in total, you should have six scoreboards that are being added. Inside of your apply motion function, we need to use an execute store command. And this takes data from one place and puts it into another place. And in this case, we want to take the position NBT from the entity and put it into a scoreboard. So execute store result, and the first part of execute store is the destination. And since we're trying to store into a scoreboard, we put execute store result score. And then the entity we want is the current entity whose motion is being changed. So result score at S. And then which scoreboard do we want to store it into? Well, I'm going to start with X1. So at S and then motion X1. And then after we select the destination of the data, we want to actually get the data. So what I'm going to do is run data, get, and then entity for the current entity, and we want their position. So that would be POS for position, and it's position 0 is for the X value, and position 1 is for Y, and position 2 is for the Z value. And then after that, the last thing you need is a scale. Scoreboards in Minecraft only hold integer values, so you can't store decimals. However, position, if you want accuracy, needs decimals. So in order to get around that, what you do is you input a scale value of 1,000. For example, if the position value is 100.5, you multiply it by 1,000 so that it'll actually store that 0.5 value as part of the scoreboard. And later on, when you need to retrieve it, you can just scale it back down again in order to get a decimal point. So now if I get this and I copy it for Y and for Z, so motion Y1 and motion Z1, and I want to retrieve position one and position two, then you'll notice it should store all of this properly. So if I go reload and let me display the scoreboard. So motion X1, I'm gonna display on the side and now I'm gonna run that throw function. And as you'll notice on the side, it has actually stored that information. As you can see, it scaled it by a thousand. And if you'll notice, it should be about 220, yeah. So if you'll notice over here in the F3 menu, our coordinates are like 220.637 and multiplying it by a thousand will move the decimal point to the end there to maintain its accuracy. So just to recap quickly about the execute store command, what we're doing is first selecting the destination, which in this case is the scoreboard. So score for the current entity's motion x1 score. And then we have to run a command to retrieve data from some place. And in this case, I'm running a data get command to retrieve the number value for position zero of the entity, which is the x value. And then I repeat that for y and z in order to get all three coordinates. So now what we need to do, if you'll remember, we need to teleport the entity a little bit in the direction we want it to go. And this is very easy. So TP at s and since this function is running in the correct rotation which we set inside of here when i did this rotated as the nearest player section and then all i have to do is do vector coordinates and then i'll teleport it like 0.1 blocks forwards and that means it'll teleport a little bit in the direction we want it to go and that means we could do the next part which is getting the second position coordinates so if i paste this down and then all I have to do now is change x1, y1, and z1 to x2, y2, and z2. And then we should get the second coordinates, which will be a little bit different from these coordinates. So now if I run the throw function, you'll notice I get x1, and this number ends with 489. But if I go and display x2, you'll notice it's a different number, and it ends with 425. And remember, we need those two numbers in order to create the motion vector. 
Now comes the final part. What we want to do is subtract the first coordinate set from the second coordinate set in order to get the vector that points in the proper direction so that when the motion is inputted back into the motion data of the projectile, it'll actually fly in the direction we want. And now this part will be condensed into one command, but for now I'm going to show you the two separate commands so that it's easier for you to understand when I do condense it down. So first what I want to do is subtract the first from the second, and the way we'll do this is using scoreboard operations. So what I do is scoreboard, players, and then operation, and this basically lets us do math. So the first scoreboard we want is the one that we're going to be changing, and we're going to be subtracting the first one from the second one, which means that the second coordinate set is going to change. Motion x2. And then after that we want to do minus equals because that means it'll subtract the second number from the first number and then it'll set the first number to whatever the result is. So for example 5 minus equals 3, it'll set whatever the 5 was and it'll become 2. So motion x2 minus equals at s motion x1. So the result of this function is that motion x2 is going to be the difference between x2 and x1. So I'll set x2 for display and you'll notice it'll be a lot smaller of a number. So as you can see it's only negative 34 and the reason it's so small is that it's only the difference between the first and second coordinates as opposed to being an actual coordinate number itself. And then I need to use an execute store command in order to put this motion value back into the actual motion nbt data. So remember execute store and then result and then I first select the destination, and in this case the destination is now the NBT of the entity, and since we're changing entity data, I select entity, and then I select the current entity because that's the motion we're changing, and then now I choose the location, and since we're doing the X motion, I'm going to do motion 0, which basically means the first number in the motion list. And then after that, we want to select the data type, which in this case is a double. And the reason you know that is if I do data get at s, oh, entity at s motion, motion zero, you'll notice that my motion is 0.0d, and this d means double. So that means I select double as the number type. And then after that, I choose the scale. And remember earlier we did it by a thousand, so I could just undo that. But the thing is that's probably not but the thing is that's probably not going to be enough. So I'm just going to set it to this number or whatever, and I could always change it later on. So now that we chose the destination of the data, we need to retrieve data. And now what I'm going to do is run scoreboard players get at s and then we want to retrieve this number that we just created, which is motion x2. So motion x2, because remember motion x2 is no longer the second position, but is now the difference between the second and first position, which if you'll remember from my explanation earlier, makes up the vector that we want the projectile to move along. So now the result of all of this is that it will take the difference between the first and second positions and store it into the motion of the entity that's being launched. So if I go back into Minecraft, You'll notice since I only did the x values, it's only going to do the x values. But if I run the throw function, it actually has some movement in the x direction. So now I'll show you how we could condense these together. And the reason we could do that is that when you run a scoreboard operation command, it actually returns the value of the first scoreboard, which is the one that you're editing. So let's say motion x2 was a value of 5 and motion x1 was a value of 3 then it'll change motion x2 to become 2, but not only that, it will return, or basically say, a value which is equal to x2, and in that case it would be a 2. So if I take this, and instead of running a get command, I run the operation command, it will take the data, which in this case will be the new value of motion x2, and it will store this directly into motion 0. So we could basically cut out that other command and reduce the amount of commands we have. So now motion 0, motion 1, motion 2, and then we change x to y, and we do the same thing for z. So now if I run the throw function again, You'll notice that it actually flies in the direction that I'm looking. 
And remember I mentioned earlier how we could scale the magnitude of the vector by scaling all the numbers. And that's super easy to do with the execute store command. So all we have to do is change this number. So if I want to up this, let's say, to 0.01, then it'll just scale it differently. And then I run the throw function, and now it throws a bit harder than it was before.